Hey everyone, what is up and welcome back to another episode of the Lifestyle Lifter Show. I'm your host, your online transformation coach, Adrian McDonald, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Leanne Fontaine. Leanne is an online health and fitness coach and she's also a natural pro bodybuilder. Leanne, welcome to the Lifestyle Lifter Show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me on. Awesome stuff, awesome stuff. Happy to talk all things, Leanne. First of all, just for any of our listeners who are unfamiliar with yourself, Leanne, share a bit about yourself, um, about what got you actually into bodybuilding in the first place, and just a bit about your backstory. So a little bit of background. I started fitness actually not that long ago. Um, I started my fitness journey a couple of years back. And the reason I got into fitness in the first place, because I was starting a new job in the corporate world in software sales. So think your typical nine to five, Monday to Friday, a um, couple of days a week in London, et cetera. And my biggest fear was that that new role was going to become like really time consuming and um, really stressful. And I was worried about having time for myself. Um, with that, it was also winter. Um, I wasn't getting out of the house a lot and I decided to sign up with my own online coach. So I went through my own kind of transformation from a fitness perspective, very, very quickly fell in love with wow. the journey. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's a little bit crazy to look back, um, but I, I quickly fell in love with the journey. And the reason being is because not only did I love the education around um, fitness and everything that it could do, not just physically, but mentally, um, but also because of the fact that I was doing this around my everyday job, I could fit it in and I could easily and very quickly see the rewards. And again, not even from a physical perspective, but more from the mental side of things, the increase in confidence um, and all of all of the, the, I guess, like I say, the mental side of things that come with it. So falling in love with it. Um, I then wanted to learn more. So I took it upon myself to get educated and qualify um, and started coaching clients myself. Um, I wanted to be able to give that opportunity and that experience that I'd had to other women who were also really busy, whether it was due to work life, whether they're working mums, um, whether they're just left uni and they're going into their first full time job. Um, but pretty much, yeah, you name it. It was about how it could could fit into their lifestyles. Um, and then into bodybuilding. So after setting up my own business and doing um, coaching, getting lots of women on board, um, a caveat, I have ADHD, so I get bored quite quickly. Um, meaning if, I, if once I'm comfortable with something and I've settled, I need something else to focus on. <laughs> um, so that is where the bodybuilding came into it. And I was like, right, what's Amazing. next? Um wow. Never thought about bodybuilding in my life. Um, and I think it was February. I first thought about it last year, mentioned it to my husband. He was like, yep, yeah, you could do that. And in March, I signed up with my coach <laughs> to start Oh my prep. God. So, action taker, action taker, quick action yeah. taker, unreal. Mm -hmm. And so let's just kind of rewind back the clocks a small bit. You mentioned that obviously you were in the corporate job. And what? How long were you working corporate before you left that to become a full-time coach? Um, so I was in corporate, I was in that role specifically for a year and a half. Um, I started my online coaching business a year in. So then I had about six months of doing both. Um, sure. So yeah. I was, uh, again, quite luckily got to a point quite quickly where I was probably spending more time at my corporate job thinking about my clients, which wasn't fair on the business that were paying me and employing me. So that's when I thought, you know what? it's time to do this full time and do what do what I really love. Deadly, yeah. And for so Leanne, what year was that that you you left corporate to go full time? That was last year, 2023. Last year, 2023. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I know and some of the audience I'm sure are aware of my own backstory because I can relate to that, Leanne. We'll speak about time management in a second because I used to be a primary school teacher, balance both, you know, training clients in person, the online it just got a bit overwhelming and like yourself, I just got to a point where I actually felt just burned out and I was someone who was promoting health and fitness, even though on the inside, I was far from healthy and fit myself between stress, lack of sleep and so on before before I left it, December 2020, December 2020. But you mentioned there, Leanne, an important point that you've built this amazing physique despite the fact that you were working two full-time jobs. So... Mm -hmm. 
Can you speak to the everyday listener about just some time management tips that they can actually fit exercise into a busy schedule? Definitely. And I think I think the first thing to remember here is that you're never too busy for the things that you really want to do. So or really have to do. So if you have a project on at work or you have a deadline for a specific thing, that thing always gets done. You always find the time. So it's more about reframing and thinking, right, what are my non-negotiables today? So for me, fitness became one of my non-negotiables. And if it meant sacrificing something else, then it meant sacrificing something else. And there was nothing that was going to get between that. Um, And I also think another thing to kind of caveat this with is there's a difference between motivation and discipline, because there are going to be times where you feel like you don't have motivation to do something. And you'll then make the excuse that you don't have time because you use that time for other things that you do have the motivation for. So it's about finding the discipline of sticking to whatever program you're working towards, whether it's two days a week training or five days a week training, it really doesn't matter. Um, But it's about having the discipline to just show up consistently, regardless, the same as brushing your teeth, the same as eating your meals. Um, I think that's one of the key things. Once you've got that as a discipline, it's very easy to make time for it because it's a non-negotiable. So you wouldn't you wouldn't go to bed at night without spending those two minutes to brush your teeth. You have the time. And if it means going to bed two minutes later, you go to bed two minutes later. Wow, that's such a that is such a great analogy. I've never heard anyone put it so simply but so effectively. And as you said, it's not just about motivation, it's about discipline. Discipline is doing the thing that you said you're gonna do, regardless of how you feel. For you, Leanne, how did you fit that? So how did you work your schedule so that fitness was a non-negotiable for you? Did you prefer time of day or did you like plan your day in advance? How exactly did you work that? So it's kind of adapted as my roles have changed. So when I was working full time and I had my set hours, I was, well, I did become one of these early morning people. And I set my alarm no matter what time it had to be to get to the gym So for me, it was 5 or 5.30 in the morning. And I hate to be one of those people that preach like the kind of 5 a.m. club. (laughs) Um, But it had to be done. And that was was my routine to get it in. So I would wake up at 5, 5 5.30. I'd eat my meal. I'd get ready for the gym. I'd walk to the gym to get my steps in. And I'd do my session. I'd then have enough time to get back, shower, get ready and work. Um, The days where I was in the office, I knew that I wouldn't train on those days. So I'd counter that in make sure I would still have enough um, kind of activity to get my steps in, to hit that step target. But my training would be around that. So I'd make sure my work from home days or my weekends would be my training days. Um, As that's shifted and now I have more flexibility and this might ring true more towards people who are self-employed or work from home. um, If you have a little bit more flexibility with your working hours, one thing that I do now is I actually wake up not really early my average wake up time is probably about seven in the morning which isn't crazy I'll wake up and because I am probably most productive in the morning I'll actually open my laptop pretty much first thing and get an hour and an hour and a half of work done then I'll normally go to the gym about nine o'clock but I've already done an hour and a half of work then I'll come back and carry on so if you have that flexibility of working from home it's just finding what works for you um and of course whether you're employed or self-employed so I, I'm the exact same. I get up still quite early, but my most productive time, the most amount of work that I do, it's in those first two or three hours. I get to a point then where I'm like, okay, my head is a bit fried. I need to take a break. I go for a walk, grab a coffee, go to the gym, and then I'm ready for work block two. We're, we're very similar in that front, Leanne. Exactly. Um, tell me this then. So we can relate this. So obviously you're a pro, uh, pro bodybuilding athlete, Leanne. And... Let's relate this to not only stepping up on stage for body, but let's just say now for someone who wants to look their best, feel their best, perform their best for, let's just say, a wedding in the summertime. For you prepping for a show or for someone looking their best for an event, how much time do you feel you should give yourself in order to be ready? Oh, it's a very, it's a difficult question. And the reason being, um, one, it depends on your starting point. Yeah. Two, it depends on your goal and what you class as ready. Um, sure. Because there's everyone has different goals. And I think with, with social media, it can be very easy that 
there is a perfect look and this is how you should look on your wedding day and this is how you should this is how thin your waist should be um, sure. for me I think it's very much about when are you going to feel your most confident and that happens over time and that's more of a feeling than something that's visual and I think within a couple of weeks of most people starting their fitness journey they will start to feel better in themselves in terms of confidence in their clothes fitting a little bit dif differently and a little bit nicer and more comfortably um but I think that confidence side of things is way more important and it's that feeling rather than the visuals um which kind of sounds counterintuitive coming from a bodybuilder and it's all about that look um but when you're thinking kind of wedding and just wanting to radiate the best version of you to everybody and of course you want that captured on camera and videos and things like that um I think it's really important in terms of timeline. You're going to have a set timeline because you've got that end date in mind. Yes. In terms yeah. of starting, as cliche as it sounds, the sooner the better, because the sooner you can start to reap those rewards, the sooner you'll start to feel the benefits. Um, and once you're feeling the benefits, it, it then becomes a lot easier. Um, it becomes less of a task. It becomes less daunting. And the more time you give yourself, the, the less Absolutely. pressure as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm sure you've probably encountered too, the client who comes to you four weeks out from a holiday or for a wedding saying, <laughs> hey, I want to look my best for insert event. It's four weeks away. Can you help me? It's like, give yourself more time. And first of all, it's going to be much more sustainable. Second of all, even when you reach there, you're less likely to rebound on yo-yo because you didn't do it through unsustainable methods. And it's just putting less stress in the body. It's putting less stress yeah. in the body. Exactly. And I, I think it's about setting those expectations as well. So yes, I can, I can make you feel and look better in four weeks. But one, it's not going to be sustainable. Two, you're probably not going to enjoy the next four weeks because we're going to have to go quite extreme <laughs> again, depending on the starting point. Um, so yeah, the 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 more time you have, the the slower you can do it, but in a more sustainable way, which makes the process way more enjoyable. Um, and kind of comparing that to bodybuilding, you'll have people that will go through a prep, so their dieting phase. Some people will prep for only eight weeks. Other people will prep for twenty because they like that slower approach. So it's figuring out what works for you, but I'm definitely more of a slower and sustainable person myself. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And just with that as well, what Leanne mentioned there, it really is a recipe though for yo-yo dieting. Because let's just say you're a guy now and you want to look your best in four weeks time when you go from consuming an average of 2,500 to 1,500 calories and 1,500 calories for four straight weeks. And then you have a, a week holiday. And you go from 1,500 straight up to freaking 3,000, 4,000 from <laughs> having pizza, drinking margaritas. You will gain so much weight because your calories have doubled in no period of time. Whereas if you give yourself, if you actually do it right and you know you want to look your best for something six months down the line, you should aim to be finished by five months time and reverse diet out of that. So you're actually peaking and your calories are increasing for the event itself, which is the opposite of what most people do in the end. Tell me yeah. this then. So you're a big believer in obviously giving yourself enough time. You kind of mentioned that 16 to 20 week bracket there. So you're talking four or five months. When it comes to actually training then, what is your preferred training split? I know the best, the best split depends on the number of days you're able to train a week. I think the average listener here will probably train four four times a week. You probably train more frequently, but let's just say for, for yourself and then speaking to the masses, what would you say are some optimal training splits to follow or even principles? Yeah, I think uh, you've kind of said it in that it, it's down to what you can be most consistent at. So if you were to set a program that was five days a week training, and realistically, you're only getting to the gym on average three days a week, some weeks you're making the five and some weeks you're only making the three, that's not optimal. You'd be way more, you'd be way better at doing just three days a week and sticking to it and really nail, nailing that three day split. That's just so that you don't end up missing and certain muscle groups or doubling up on certain muscle group groups that you really need to target. Um, for most of my clients, they train between two to four times a week, um, dependent on their, their lifestyles. Um, like if, if I've got some mums, for example, they'll just do two workouts a week at home. And that's okay because that's what they can get done. And it's better yeah. than doing nothing. Absolutely. Um, for me, I train four times a week, um, strength training. 
So my split at the moment is um, two lower body days, one upper body day, and then one kind of top up session. I'm just coming out of a reverse at the moment. So my training isn't kind of crazy. Um, and then I've got a couple of cardio days in where I'm doing a couple of runs each week as well, kind of be five, Amazing. six days. Deadly, um, unreal stuff. Yeah. And then I'd say if if I wanted to pull back training a little bit, I'd probably go down to three days um, and split wise, again, kind of upper lower full body or like a push pull full body yeah. split. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the principles there that for your top up day, I'm actually curious, would that just be specific body parts like bringing up your glutes, for instance, or... Yeah, exactly that. So with the kind of mindset of competing, there's certain areas that they look for. Yeah. So my top up day is glutes and delts um, to help build up for bikini criteria. Deadly, deadly, unreal stuff. And for your preferred form of cardio then, Leanne, I know you mentioned running there. Did you find, did you do running during prep or did you do something else? Um, During prep, my cardio was Stairmaster. That was my go-to. Yeah. Um, just because it was really easy for me to jump on it for 45 minutes, which was the most I ever did, luckily. Um, I know some people <laughs> would do a lot more cardio during prep, but mine was about 45 minutes a day. Um, and the reason I did Stairmaster was because it was easy for me to work at the same time. So I'd actually spend that 45 minutes on my phone, responding to clients, editing um, content and things like that. So I that was that. why. Um, or sometimes if I didn't want to work, I'd actually read and just take my Kindle and read while I was in the Stairmaster. Yeah, um, At the moment, though, I have just started running. So I've never been a runner. Um, I am completely new to running. I do think, that obviously, the Stairmaster over the last six months has helped me. Um, but I am just started, like I say, got up to five, 6K runs at the moment, and I'm running twice a week. So Deadly. I'm enjoying that. It's not nice in winter. It's freezing in England at the moment as in like minus five and um, so my runs are on a treadmill but I'm looking forward to running outside absolutely absolutely I, I love an outdoor run I love an outdoor run <laughs> even if even if like if the weather is somewhat dry and it's even cold but it's crisp I'll take that there's something nice about it but as you said yeah when it's when it's slippy when it's icy when it's rainy sometimes <laughs> it's better to do it on the treadmill uh, from a selfish really? and selfish point of view Leanne I know a lot of people listen building their glutes is actually a big priority. What would you say are some of your top exercises that you found that work well for you? Well, I love this question. Um, it actually took me a really long time to find exercises where I could get the glute engagement that I needed. Um, just because of, of how I'm built more than anything. I'm quite long limbed. Um, although I'm not tall, um, my limbs are quite long. So I had to adjust quite a few of my exercises. My go-tos are love hate relationship with split spots as I think everyone does yeah. um glute kickbacks so cable machine really really good for that constant tension um hip thrusts I do hip thrusts on a lot of my sessions um but again it's really effective and uh glute hyperextensions as well so oh. I'd say they're my main ones amazing uh glute hyperextensions something I've only hopped on the bandwagon in the last like two weeks not that I haven't done them um, before but just a little cue that helped me out was drive your quads into the hyperextension like just jam yeah. them in drive the quads in and fold yourself in half like I there's nothing better in my opinion than the feeling of a good leg session and like good pain yeah. the following day. We all know the difference between good and bad pain, but oh my <laughs> God, the contraction I got in those, unbelievable work for the glutes. When it comes to dieting then, Leanne, what are your thoughts on, just from a, speaking to the masses here, providing someone with a meal plan versus like giving them maybe macros and give them some guidelines? There's no one size fits all, of course. What are some of your personal philosophies? Um, With my clients, I don't, I don't do meal plans. Um, and the reason being is because I think it's quite restrictive um, and it also leaves a lot of education on the table. Yeah. So if I was to just say, look, eat, eat these meals for the next six weeks and you'll get the results that, that you're looking for. Um, my clients aren't going to understand why. And they're probably going to get bored of the meals. They're not going to know how to change them. And it also doesn't set them up for success if, thing, if life throws new things at them. So if they then yeah. need to go out for dinner. Um, and choose something off a menu or they've booked in a bottomless brunch with their friends they're not going to know how to navigate those situations um so for me I go for the macro approach and calories and protein and do a lot of education around protein carbs yeah. fats fiber um because that way 
it becomes a lot more sustainable long term because the last thing you want as you mentioned earlier is that yo-yo diet where you get the results you don't actually understand how you've got them and you just bounce back because you go back to old habits whereas actually if you have the education you know how to sustain it longer term yeah yeah oh such a it's it's so it's so common it really is so common and it's not necessarily true any coaches fall to such but I do think I do think a, a, a good coach at least should provide the client with some guidance and not just the process of dropping, but the aftermath too. And I'm sure you found that yourself, yeah, I'm a bodybuilder. And like, once you finish your cut, that's when you're most liable to gain mm-hmm. weight because you're so lean, your body is somewhat deprived and you just crave all the food. So for someone who out there, Leanne, who has just finished their fat loss phase and now they want to transverse or reverse out and do a lean bulking phase, what are some general guidelines that you would recommend? And um, stick with your coach would be number one. Um, yeah, yeah. I've seen it so many times where people have got the results that they want um, and then think, oh, I've done it now. I don't need a coach anymore. Um, but it, like you say, it can be the hardest point because the last thing you want to do is undo all of your hard work. So going through that education and having someone hold you accountable through that reverse to get you to maintenance and that lean build, I think is really important um, so that you don't bounce back because the last thing you want to do is waste your money, your time, um, and all of the energy you've just put in to get those results. Um, So that would be my number one is just stick with a coach, have someone there to help you hold you accountable um, and educate you on that process as well. Um, but then I would also say, um, in the nicest possible way, like don't be an idiot um, when it comes to it. Yeah. You've worked so hard. Um, and if you've dieted down for a certain period of time, you know that food is always going to be there. It's not going anywhere. And it will get to a point where you're eating more calories and you can consume more and you've got more flexibility. Um, just be patient and trust the process. Yeah. Because if you do it too soon, you're just going to ruin the hard work you put in. So uh, I would, that's golden nuggets there, everyone. And I would argue that the reverse is just as challenging as the cut itself. Because let's just say you're peaking for a holiday, you're peaking for a bodybuilding show. It's like, now that the event is over, what's really holding you accountable? What are you working towards? Unless you have another show or not another holiday or another event, the temptation is always going to be there that you can just completely bench and that's when you're liable to gain so much weight in such a short period of time, which is obviously going to just mentally affect you and, and have some adverse effects on your body and your mindset and everything. For yourself, Leanne, going through a bodybuilding phase, did you deal with any personal struggles or challenges along the way that come to mind that like, God, I can't believe I overcame that or just what were some of your general struggles and challenges along the way? Um. Again, going back to kind of plugging in because of my ADHD, I actually didn't struggle very much with bodybuilding, prep, um, all of that, because it my, my brain likes that. My brain likes having something to focus on constantly. Um, so the, the hardest part for me, I think, was everybody else um, rather than actually what I was doing. And it was other people around me like close family and friends found it a lot harder than I did yeah so you get the comments like um oh you're not eating enough this isn't healthy and actually they don't see a lot of what's going on they don't see that I'm actually consuming 3,000 calories the day before I'm going on stage they think I'm eating next to nothing they don't see that my meals are like perfectly balanced to make sure I'm as healthy as I possibly can be um so it's the comments and, and again, I think social media plays a part in that because you only show so much as well. You don't show every meal that you're eating and you don't show all of that side of things. Um, but I think the lack of understanding and because bodybuilding isn't a massive sport, it means that the people around you don't often understand why you're doing it. Um, and they can struggle with that. I, th- I had messages of my stepdad like, oh, I'm really worried about you and things like yes, this. And I was like, yeah. I'm fine. I'm absolutely okay. And if if I was really, if there was anything kind of detrimental going on, I'd stop. Um, and it's nice that they're worried. Um, but again, I, I think a lot of the comments can also come from people because of that kind of education side that isn't there. 
if my uncle commented and said, oh, this isn't healthy. And that's coming from a middle-aged man who drinks a bottle of red wine a night. That's not healthy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I think it's just perception, it's education. And I think that was probably the hardest part. And it's knowing when to educate people when they make those comments versus when to just keep your mouth shut and and just let them carry on thinking what they're thinking. (laughs) You're preaching here. Oh, my God. I I had a lot of similar comments too. Like people saying, I'm worried about you. Are you okay? (laughs) Do, do you want to eat a bit more food there? You know, my yeah. mum, Adrian, I'm not going to lie now. I, I didn't really like when you were doing that bodybuilding. I, I'm much happier. I, I like the way you look much more <laughs> now. It's like, man, yeah, you t- sometimes as you said, you pick your battles. Sometimes you can you can yeah. argue with them and other times it's just be- best to keep the mouth closed and, and understand that they don't really have a, a deep, uh, talking of understanding of what the actual process is. Tell me this then, Leanne, just for the everyday listener, what are some common fat loss mistakes that you see a lot of people make that they should avoid? Um, most common ones, I think fad diets are, are always going to be up there. Um, not to name any in particular, because they're all different in their own ways. So it'd be hard to target just the one. But when they are kind of prying on people who are desperate to make these quick changes, um, again, a lot of the education is missing from these things. So whether it's a shake diet that you're doing, um, whether it is based on kind of um, points uh, and things like that, you're, you're never really educated as to why that's going to get you the results, um, which I think, again, the education piece pay, plays such a huge part in the longevity of of how long you can keep something up. Um, and again, it bounces back to why so many people who do those diets yo-yo. Um, so I think that is one of the mistakes. And I think two is not being realistic. Um Uh, with the results that they're looking to get it's very easy with social media to look at someone and think oh they got these results in 12 weeks they probably did but how long have they been training before that and have they been going to the gym for the last 10 years because if so they've got way more muscle mass their metabolism is much much quicker they're going to be able to eat more than you are at this point um so it's it's having that education and realistic expectations around that side of things as well and just to to follow up on that even if they got insane results in 12 weeks, you don't know what they have to do to get those results. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> looking from the outside, it, it might look great, but do you want, like for some people it could be, they got those results, but they were consuming 1300 calories doing five strength and six cardio sessions per week yeah. for the last 12 weeks. Is that something you want to do? Is that something you're willing to do? So yeah. again, it, there's trade-offs to everything. What would you say, Leanne, then, when it comes to the gym, we spoke a lot about yo-yo diet and unsustainable methods. What are some common mistakes that you see people make in the gym on a regular basis? Um, I think the key one being is just not going with a plan yeah, uh, yeah. And, and not having that structure. In, in order to get any kind of results, you need that repeatability and you need that structure to be able to progress on your lifts, to progress on your strength and to get the hypertrophy that you need to build muscle. If you're going in and you're winging it each time and just using whichever piece of equipment looks good and is free and to use with nobody else on it, then um, you're you're not going to get the results that you need. So I think going in with a plan is the number one thing that you should be doing versus what people don't do. And that's also um, probably the co- the number one cause of gym anxiety, like or even yes. lacking gym confidence. It comes from not having a plan. If you have a plan in place, at least you know what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, and you've some sort of a routine. Exactly, and I think with with the gym um, anxiety side of things as well, it's then about having a backup plan. So, right, this these are the five exercises I'm going to do today. If I get there and exercise one is taken and I can't do it. Am I going to panic or am I going to go straight to exercise two? And if that's taken, what am I going to do? And it's just being prepared for those situations. Deadly. I love all that. Question for you, Leanne. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Should women and men train differently? (laughs) Good question. Um, in, In what sense? So do gender specific exercises exist? No is the short answer um however if, if i'm being kind of stereotypical my male clients have different goals to my female clients from a that's, physical perspective yeah yeah and so, that's yeah. go ahead sorry yeah. no you're all good so uh, i will program typically a lot more glute exercises for my female clients <laughs> 
and I'll target, uh, I'll program a lot more chest exercises for my male clients. <laughs> um, it's not to say that women can't bench press and it's not to yeah. say a man can't use a glute drive. Um, so, and I, and I will program those kind of exercises for each gender. Um, but it yeah. is, it, it's goal dependent more than anything. And if I do exactly. have a guy come to me and say, I want to grow my glutes, you'll absolutely be programmed with glutes. And if a yeah. woman wants to grow her chest or back, we'll grow her chest and back. Deadly. Yeah. I'm the, like, I actually made a reel on that. And it's, uh, you should be programmed based off, based off goals, not based off gender. Because yes, typically guys want to train their chest more. Yes, typically <laughs> girls want to train their glutes more. I, for one, this year, I want to get back sprinting pain-free. And my physio said I need to grow bigger glutes. So big, big yeah. goal of mine this year. I was doing hip thrusts today. I was doing hyper extensions. I was doing freaking RDLs. I want to grow the glutes. So look, it, it's it's goal dependent, not gender gender dependent. I think for the most part, but that's just where personalization, custom customization comes in. For yourself, Ian, we're at the start of January twenty twenty four. Have you any goals for the year ahead? Oh, so many. Um, fitness perspective. At the moment, I am just trying to build as much good quality muscle tissue as possible. Yeah. Um, I don't know when or if I'll be competing again this year. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just doing everything I can to make sure if I do decide to, I'm in a good place to start again. Um, so that's from a fitness perspective. Nutritionally, um, it's about, again, nailing this reverse. I've got a couple of weeks left. Um, and w with reversing out and going back into more food and more variety of foods, it's just making sure there's an eye kept on things like my digestion, hormones and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then business. So I think for me, it's just making sure I can help as many women as possible. Um, to, I say women, I coach both women and men, but mo mostly women, as many women as possible to to feel and look their absolute best. Amazing. I love all three of those goals. And Leanne, for any of your listeners out there who want to learn more about working with yourself or even just what you do, where is the best place to send them? Um, my Instagram. So it's leanne.fitness. Uh, Leanne, L-I-A-N-N-E dot fitness um, is the best place. And you just shoot me a DM, drop me a voice note, say you've listened to me here, and that'd be great. Awesome. I'll I'll post for for all of our listeners as always. I'll post a link to Leanne's to Leanne's IG in the show notes. Leanne, final question because this is the lifestyle lifters show. What is your definition of living a successful lifestyle? <sighs> Very good question. S success without wanting to long out the answer. Success is so dependent on the individual. Um, success for one person can mean working a nine till five, finishing at five o'clock on a Friday and having their weekends to do absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, success for someone else could mean they're working 18 hours a day and in all the money in the world and they don't have a social life, but they're happy with that because that, that's their definition of success. So uh, a successful lifestyle is really firstly about setting your own goals, um, realizing your own values. And I think for anyone that doesn't do this, I think it's good to take a reflection on what are your goals, short-term, long-term, um, what do you need to do to get there and what are your core values that you're going to associate all of your decisions around. Once you've done that, you'll help define your own successful lifestyle um, and what that includes. Amazing. Such a great answer. And such power in that also. Because as you said, when you define your values, it's very, very easy to make decisions there. Definitely. Is this helping or hindering me? Is this moving me towards or away from my goals, my values? Yeah. Yeah. And this has been amazing. Unbelievable episode. Thank you, Thank you so much again for coming mm -hmm. on. And yeah. for all of the listeners, again, make sure you you drop me on a follow on our socials so or post that in the show notes. And for all of our listeners, if you're not already subscribed, please do subscribe to the Lifestyle Lifter Show. Off all platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, podcasts are generally the hardest to grow. And that's why it's so important that if you're listening to this regularly, you please do subscribe. Until next Wednesday, thank you all very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this week's episode.